You know, it's a funny thing when you have an opportunity to talk to a, an audience of your peers. And we actually started this off today saying that we wanted to talk a little bit about the business side, then we wanted to talk a little bit about the technology side. And as Jason and I talked about this a little bit, we actually said, you know what? Let's step up. Step up just a little bit higher. For seven minutes, I, and I know this is a strange thing to ask at OCP, for seven minutes, we want you to forget about the technology. Not quite, but we want to focus on something else. For just a moment, we want us to reflect about the mission of what we can go build together. So here's my question to you. You know, we, we all join the high-tech engineering tribe somewhere. When did you join the tribe? When did you say, hey, this is the career for me? Well, let me tell you a little bit about my story to flesh it out and make you think about your own story. I started off 17 years of age in Seattle. Well, actually, it was Bellevue. And I joined a startup. You know, I wish it had been Microsoft. It could have been me and Walmer running around, right? Um, and I joined an offshoot, a CDC, where we were going to go invent something sort of like this ARPANET thing and turn it into a network. I would love to tell you that me and Al Gore started the internet, but my startup happened to die and burn right on the launching pad. So we're probably brothers, because many of you have experienced the exact same thing. Since that time, I graduated with my degree in electrical engineering. I've been a computer engineer. I've been a software manager with a wonderful group of guys that were ex-Microsoft people. And I've been a P&L owner for almost three years. That's my story of joining the electrical engineering tribe. But just like many of you, I'm not only an engineer, but I'm also a husband, I'm a father. And part of this is I saw that our technology, and I think all of you guys understand that our technology is more than just creating a new standard, and it's more than just creating a new job. It's not just about the standards, and it's not just about the business cases. It's asking, what are we creating for our children in the future? So this is a picture of my daughter in 2004. I've been blessed with four kids. And of course, I try to immortalize some of those images. 200 kilobytes right there. It's not 200 kilobytes. It's one memory, which has gone in the past that I can pull up at any time. So now I want you to fast forward 12 years with me to the summer of 2016. And as you can imagine, just like my children, our technology, what we have done in the cloud, has grown. And I want to share with you the happiest day of my life and of my daughter's life. This was her marriage. I'm here today to talk about a four megabyte image. And if you think about it, we've grown from 200 exabytes 12 years ago where I took a grainy picture of my daughter to four megabytes just last summer. So the question is, is what did 20 times the data find it? Did it, it just find us that, hey, we set a new spec? You know, for me, it found me a memory of joy, of happiness, of belonging. And we were able to pull in the faces of all her flower girl with more clarity than the shot I took of my single daughter. 12 years ago. So my question to you when we start to think about data storage, which face would we want to drop? What memory would we like to forget? Because in our mind at Seagate, what we're doing with life is striving to do just one thing. We want to figure out how to remove the delete key off your keyboard. Now, maybe you want to throw some stuff away, and we'll have a special function for you. But there should be no reason that at any time in the future that we should have to throw away anything. And what does it take for us to go get there? What it takes for us to go get there is a story of and at a 50,000 foot level. And it can't be a story of or. It's a story of trying to figure out how do we draw in more resources for what do we need to do. I just want to show this chart. This is where we were last quarter in terms of exabytes shipped. Flash is a wonderful substance, and it shipped about 25 exabytes. Hard disk drives is a wonderful substance, and it shipped almost 10 times the exabytes. And by the way, we're about at one-tenth of the cost. 
I used to be at the IBM PC company. And when I look at the old legacy architecture, that old legacy architecture was a story of war. It was like watching, watching into a British restroom where they always crazily have the whole cold separated away from the hot. And what have we done in the hyperconverged, hyperscale market is we figured out some way of kludging them together. And it's been a good kludge. But the question is, is have we really gone deep enough? At least for us on the technology side, which Jason's going to fill you in in just a second, one of the top things that we're thinking about is we've been on a technology S curve on the SSD, and it's allowed us to drive up the temperature and the heat of that. And that's always going to increase, and that's great, but there's going to come a time of diminishing returns. So for about 30 years, we've been stuck with this HDD performance bottleneck, and we need to start asking ourselves, at what point do we stop improving the sections where we're good? and we start taking care of the sections which are our poor shots. For us, our first generation, which we're happy to go talk to you over in our booth, basically allows you to double the, the uh, heat on the cold side. And that's gonna allow you to deliver the quality of service that you need to be able to deliver that value proposition. So at a high level, that's what we're talking to you about. And that's what some of the top level ideas that Jason will take you through. We're gonna keep the gas um, on NAND to HDDs at 10x or greater with Hammer, I'm actually hoping we drive far, far harder than that. Now there's gonna be a bill up front, but it's the right bill to pay. Then we need to think about how do we start to deal with the bad shots? How do we break the performance bottlenecks that we have? And we're very excited about the first generation technology. So that and a few other key things, Jason wants to talk to you about the revolutions that we're trying to do in the hard disk drive industry. All right, thanks, Ted. Um, so excited to be on stage in front of everybody here at OCP. Uh, it's amazing to see all the collaboration, all the innovation coming together in one spot with companies and skill sets of all over the industry. And, and hopefully what you're going to get today is how every one of those skill sets is built into a disk drive and why a disk drive is such a key component to the overall storage landscape and how we want to continue to keep it relevance so that all of your businesses can continue to thrive, continue to grow, and never hit delete. Um, so with that, what we do is we start with the pain point. What we continue to look at in the market is what's happening. We're growing so fast. Data centers are popping up all around the world. The urge to get more and more data and densify the data center uh, is continuing, and it's coming to us every day with, we need to solve this problem. So with that, we look at what can we do? Uh, so two such things that we're going to talk about here at OCP, uh, the session here today, as well as other sessions that you'll see in workshops, it starts with what is the device? Density is key in storage devices, and so how do you lay out that data on the device? There are tons of software experts in this room, in this building, and with the collaboration between those software experts and our intrinsic aerial density capability, we can optimize things like data flow, data warmth, data locality, data density. One of those things is a zone block device. Mixing recording types of proven technologies which are already out in the industry, we can put both of those things together on one piece of media and allow you, the storage consumer, to deploy that technology however you want. If you want to make a dense device that optimizes for cost, you can do so. If you want to have something that can plug and play anywhere and be a completely transparent device, you can do that as well. We want to make sure that we're providing the technologies to you, the software developers, you, the consumers of storage, to optimize for your use case. And then beyond that, in the end, it's all about growth. We never want to hit the delete key. We want to make sure that we have a technology that has a future for the next 10 years. We don't want to have a flash in the pan. We want to have something that can bring us the next 10x, and that's Hammer. We've seen the ability to grow at a 30% CAGR to try to keep up with all those exponential curves you see from Microsoft Azure and from Google Cloud and from Amazon and all of the cloud deployments around the world. So with that, the key technology in all of this it starts at the base layer. It's always about the foundation. How do you grow? You have to have a strong foundation. For us, we invest heavily in both heads and media technology. The media is the base. The media is where all of this innovation comes from. If you can't get data down to the disk level, you don't have anything. 
So one of the challenges as an industry that the disk drive is facing is as bits get smaller and smaller, we pack tracks tighter together, we pack bits denser, they become thermally unstable. They're magnetic materials that as the volume drops, they intrinsically want to flip states. That's no good. We want to make sure that when data is written to disk, it stays there and it is very hard so that you can retrieve it whenever you need for your analysis. So with that, we've created Hammer, which we requires lasers to increase the heat on the media, and the media becomes higher coercivity so that those bits can be smaller and smaller and retain that magnetic moment and retain that magnetic information. To date, we've already created production media that's two terabits per square inch. If you think about a disk drive that's deployed in a data center today, you're talking about things that are 20 terabytes in today's form factor. We've also created in our labs media that can go all the way up to 10 terabits per square inch. So we know nature has the capability to deliver to us a disk drive that can go over 100 terabytes. That's exciting. When we think about that we can fuel growth for data centers for the next 10 years with one technology, with one base layer and capability with Hammer. What does it take to get it done? So Seagate as a whole, we're looking across many different engineering facets. We have investment in precision manufacturing. We have to take something the size of a piece of salt and place it on something the size of a flake of pepper and do it over and over and over in high volume manufacturing so we can produce millions of heads every quarter. We have to have experts in optics to deliver light, which is focused at something that's the width of a few strands of DNA. We're talking about carbon atom nanoscale technology inside of a disk drive that you deploy millions of in a data center and just work. It's phenomenal to think that on top of all that, we have servo experts, mechanical experts, electrical engineering experts that have to put it all together and then write firmware and transfer it off to you guys so that it can plug in and just work. So with that, you have all the density in the world, that's great. What if you can't get to it? So I think all of us know that size, cost, performance matter. Logistics in our everyday life tell us that all the time. If you want to get something there and you want to be cost effective, you put it on a boat. If you need it tomorrow, you put it on a plane. We see that same symbiotic relationship in a data center. There's varying applications, there's varying workloads. And with that, you want to make sure you're optimizing your storage deployment appropriately. Something that needs very high performance, you're going to put that on an SSD or a storage class memory. Something that needs to be able to ingest and take all of that data from the SSD quickly, you're now going to think about things that have parallelism or dual actuator. So I encourage you, the picture you see here on this slide, we have on display over at our booth uh, across the hall, uh, a few examples of these where we have dual actuator technology that we want to collaborate with the industry and bring this technology to the market and, and realize those performance gains so you can continue to see performance and capacity together. So why performance? Um, first and foremost, you know, anybody that knows the data center market knows that we get paid based on a user experience. That's how a successful business is going to grow. And with that, we take it very seriously. So a service level agreement is that mechanism for getting paid. We want to make sure, and why we've collaborated with many people to figure out the device we have today, how can we make sure it works as well as possible? We do things to control latency bounded I.O. We do locality optimizations. We do queuing. All of those things are ways to software tweak and collaborate to get things that work just right for our application. But at the same time, unfortunately, those have boundaries. We're trading something off. We're taking latency for IOPS. And at some point, you do run into a wall. And so at that point, we need to step in and make sure we have a performance that can grow again and enable more IOPS without trading off latency. And that is dual actuators. So the technology achievement is we want to make one slot in a data center in a JBOD perform like two drives. We're going to double performance, double data rate, double IOPS. That is our goal. So in the past, we developed disk drives with a very different landscape of devices out there. We have a form factor that was defined. We have a spindle speed that was defined. We had a disk size and an actuator mass that were all defined. 
That means the speed at which you were able to get data off of that drive only increased at the rate that the aerial density was growing. However fast our BPI was growing, your data rate would go up. The IOPS, however, were not changing because you're physically constrained by move times, by speeds. Um, and so now that we have all these new devices in our data center, we need to open that pipe. We need to make sure that we can ingest data down from all of these SSD devices at a faster rate to get the data from the cache, from the workload, down into its final resting place. And also, we need to make sure that all the new developments around artificial intelligence, analytics, have access to the largest data lake possible. If your data lake is huge, but you can't get data off of it, you're not gonna train a very smart model. So we wanna make sure that everybody that's creating software analysis uh, in the analytics world has access to all the data they want to make the best decision, train, and retrain. And with that, we're gonna be bringing dual actuation to the market to enable growth in that space in 2019 and beyond. So what does it mean to be beyond capacity? We've got disk drives that are going into data centers today at 10 terabytes, 12 terabytes, 14 terabytes. Those, those are achieving a 10 IOPS per terabyte target. We hear a lot about as capacity grows, we have IO bottlenecks and IO thresholds that we need to meet for the application and work, workload to run smoothly. So this is where we collaborate. We get in the room, we talk about how to tune those command latencies, with the command queues, the priority. Uh, it's really a, a hard-nosed effort that's just grind it out and make it happen. Beyond that is the dual actuator. So you can see a, a rendering of what it would look like inside of a disk drive. It's essentially two actuators together inside of, in a, inside of a disk drive to double the performance. We're looking at taking read IOPS now to 160 IOPS in one device in one slot in a data center. The other thing that's really cool to think about and very exciting for us is Today, if you think about performance and you're thinking about disk drives on a daily basis, you're probably thinking, hey, I got a 15,000 RPM disk drive. 15,000 RPM disk drive maybe only hits 280 to 300 megabytes per second, and its capacity is only 900 gigabytes. We're thinking about devices now that are gonna go 10, 12, 14, 16 terabytes in capacity and deliver 500 megabytes per second in that slot. So here's kind of a landscape of why it's important. You may think, well, today it's not really what I need. I'm still in that space where I'm optimizing latency with command queuing, priority, et cetera. Seagate's here for the long haul. We want to enable all of this scale to continue for the next 10 years, like we said, with capacity. And so for that, if you think about it, if we just had a single actuator device and you work in an IOPS per terabyte world where you're trying to meet your customer service level agreement, Quickly, we start to run into some areas where 20 terabytes and beyond, where that IOPS per terabyte threshold becomes very challenged. So what are you gonna do to solve that? You're gonna deploy more flash. Great, that's one solution. It can get you part of the way, but again, it can't get you all the way. And at the optimized TCO that we're trying to obtain for data centers, we believe that this is an enabler to continue to allow that scale at cost and to continue to grow the industry. So at 20, 30, and 40 terabytes, we really wanna to try to target a device that can deliver eight to 10 IOPS per terabyte for that use case in the storage stack. So in a forum like OCP, what do we want everybody to take away? You guys have numerous different workloads that you're running in your applications. You're creating new software every day. You have a set of reliability metrics that you need to achieve your cost and user experience. And you have a total cost of ownership model that you're trying to drive to enable your business. We are gonna bring hammer technology, dual, tech, dual actuator technology and zone block device technology. We wanna get in the room. We wanna talk about what's the right way to use these. We wanna make sure that everybody understands what they can and can't do and make sure that they're optimized for future uses and future workloads that you're gonna go create. And what does that mean we have to do and what does success look like? It means that we've got chassis that are optimized for density. When we're talking about 30 and 40 terabyte disk drives, we need to make sure that everything inside of that chassis is well understood and optimized for deployment. We wanna make sure that the collaboration is transparent. We know how a drive's gonna be ran through performance benchmarking, file I.O. Snapchats, uh, reference architect architectures, 
And then last but not least, we want to make sure we can be fast. We want to be nimble. We want to get things in your hand so that you can try them and say, yes, this makes sense. Uh, so we can quickly move on from ideas and learn and grow and get the product that we want to maximize that R&D effort for both companies uh, when we collaborate on projects. So in closing, the bottom line here, if Ted, you'd like to come back up and join me on stage here. Uh, so three, three vectors, really. You know, it's capacity growth is all about 30% CAGR and delivering hammer technology to the industry. Performance growth, which is all about enabling the users to get access to that data, doubling the IOPS, doubling the data rate, um, making sure that everybody can achieve the service level agreements. And then last but not least, and most importantly, is collaboration. So just two more slides. Jason will stay up here with me. So again, let, let's pop up to the personal level. Let's pop up to 50,000 feet. Our story doesn't end here, but what we do here sets up for what we can do in the future. And sometimes to understand the future, we need to go back to the past. So let me show you a state-of-the-art data recording device in 1922. It happens to be a picture of a house up in the hills of Los Gatos. Um, it happens to be a National Historic Registered Place. It was built by a famous author at the time, Ruth Comfort Mitchell, and her senator state husband, Sanborn Young. It also happens to be the money pit that I call home. She happened to have a play that went through the nation that would sit inside of Chinatown, and she wanted her house to look like the play that she was showing to the rest of America. And so when I go through this place, it's amazing. Wires that lead to nowhere, rooms that are added on, caves in the back of, of the property to store, I think, food or something like that. The only thing we have to remember her and her husband by is boxes of political correspondence at the University of Santa Barbara. But I want to know the house that they lived in. I'm hoping, and I think many of you hope for your children, that it's no longer static history. I hope in the future that my kids, because I'm hoping they're going to take over the house after everything I poured into it, they're going to be able to spin up a virtual image of myself, and they're going to say, hey, Grandpa, why did you put this tree in here? Grandpa, why did you put this wall over here? And I can say, I did that with your uncle. I did that with your grandma. I put this love and thought into it. Think about a world where we can record everything and leave something for our children. Thank you. Any questions? So thank you for very much for putting all this together. I had a question about your dual actuator technology. Yeah. So uh, if it's showing up as two drives, I'm assuming the operating system actually treats that as two separate devices? Yeah, one of the subtle points on the slide is that we're presenting the device as a SaaS device. Uh, leveraging technology that's already there with LUNs to the interface. Okay, so two LUNs, so what we're, when we're looking at the performance metrics, we're dividing that in two, basically, right? Yeah, by LUN. Okay, yep. perfect. Yep. Thank you. That was the quickest way for us to integrate into a commonly existing architecture, right? Exactly right. Any other questions? Repeat the question. Yeah, so the question for everybody here is, is there any sensitivity essentially to the new technologies with temperature, given that that's a key parameter that you're monitoring in the data center? Yeah, so there's nothing in hammer technology or dual actuator technology that changes the sensitivity to overall ambient air temperature in a data center from where we are today with traditional disk drives. Uh, we have overall general recommendations with within our product manuals and such and how to maximize reliability, maximize performance and throughput and overall use of a device and, and that's not changing with any of these technologies. Any other questions in the last 46 seconds that we have left? Or 
So I'm going to pick up my, my hmm. I'm very passionate about this, and I only got 16 seconds left. The secret is in the software defined storage layer. And we can do that at the data center level best. I really struggle if it was ever right at the device level. My struggle is, is I'm not clear that the uh, data center guys have quite ringed all the performance out of it. But that's personally where I believe it is. And with that, I think we're going to have the hook pulled on us. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.